Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to this session, which is the second in the series of six panel discussions on Oxford and Empire travel and translation. My name is Ben Grant. I'm a lecturer in English literature in the University of Oxford's Department for Continuing Education, and I'm the organizer of this series with Siobhan Daly. The series is under the umbrella of the Oxford and Empire Network, which is supported by the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, or TORCH for short, and it is co-sponsored by Kellogg College. This session is going to be take the form of three speakers, each speaking for about 15 minutes and then a discussion. And please do ask questions as they occur to you. You can write these in the chat. Today's topic is Oxford and Oriental Studies. And today's wonderful speakers are Mishka Sinha, Siobhan Daly and Elizabeth Grass. And I'm going to be sharing the panel myself. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mishka Sinha. And Mishka is a research associate at St John's College, Oxford, and co-directs a project on St John's and the colonial past with Professor William White. She's a cultural and intellectual historian of the modern period with wide interests and experience, and her research focuses on the history of Orientalism and the transcultural history of knowledge in the context of colonialism and empire, in particular the transfer of knowledge from Asia and Asia to Europe. Her undergraduate degree was at St Xavier's College, Bombay, followed by an MPhil at Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford, and a PhD at Queen's College, Cambridge. She's also studied at Emory University, Atlanta, and was a Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute, Florence. A Zuken, a, a Zuken, so I'm terrible at German, a Zukens Philology Fellow at Freya Universitat, Berlin, and most recently, a British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow at the Faculty of History, Cambridge, which she held in conjunction with a research associateship at St John's College, Cambridge. Over to you, Mishka. Thank you so much, um, Ben. So um, I'm going to talk today about the, the, the sort of history of Oriental studies as a discipline. Um, and I think the, the title that I gave Ben was, um, had, this, had this quotation from um, Disraeli's novel Tancred, uh, published in 1847, which was part of a trilogy that he wrote. Um, and, and the quotation was, um, the East is a career. And it's taken from a conversation, a dinner conversation that, um, that, that people, they're having about, about Tancred. Um, and this quotation was then uh, used by and became far more famous than probably when it was in the novel uh, by it is um, uh, in uh, Said, Edward Said's Orientalism in 1978, I think, was when it was published. Um, now, of course, in both contexts, not in neither context, are they really talking about careers as such? What, what Tancred, in Tancred's case, it's a kind of, uh, the, 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 the quotation basically, suggests that Tancred will go east and then become absorbed in the east, that he won't, you know, that, 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 it, that the east is a kind of all-absorbing place. And of course, the location of the east is in fact Palestine, because this is a kind of romantic, um, a romantic imperialism, but also a romantic Judaism, a kind of Judaical culture um, that's being explored as this kind of origin of culture in, in, uh, in the Jewish homeland. Um, in for, for Said, he is he's he's taking that and he's ironicizing it, um, and he's talking about the East being a career for Orientalists, um, and he's talking about Orientalists like William Jones and you know other uh, famous um, colonial administrators, and also Orientalism in in writing in novels in Flaubert in um, um, in Rudyard Kipling and you know Orientalism. As a kind and Orientalism in art and French Orientalism, um, but in in the academic sense, really the or, uh, the Orientalists he's talking about, who you know, who, who form a kind of one of the most important frames of his sort of three pronged Orientalism, this idea of an academic Orientalism, um, is they're, they're not most of these people are not professional Orientalists. They're going most of them are in the late eighteenth, early nineteenth centuries when you don't really have Orientalism as a discipline. So they're amateurs, they're either colonial administrators or they're travel writers or they're novelists uh, or, they're, or they're women writing back, writing letters and journals or, or men writing letters and journals. Um, so instead of which, what I wanted to talk about was the idea of Orientalism or rather the East as a career and that is as a locus 
as well as a subject of a profession, which is the profession of being an Orientalist that comes about really in the 19th century. Um, so the, the paper takes the phrase literally, the idea of the East as a career, um, and the purpose is to analyze the role of Oriental studies as a discipline in the development of the intellectual and cultural ethos of the modern Western university as we understand it now. Um, and part of my concern is basically to talk about how Oriental studies um, helped usher what we think of as the contemporary university into being. Um, and I'm going to try and talk about how, why I think that's the case. Um, so that's my kind of analytical point. Um, the other thing I should say is that Oriental studies is obviously very big. I mean, includes everything from, well, includes Hebrew and Arabic, which are much older studies in the West, uh, in, in Western Europe, as well as Sanskrit and Urdu and Persian and Pali and um, a whole lot of other languages as well. Um, so I'm going to focus on the subject that I've, I mean, the, the language that I've focused on in, in, in my research, which is Sanskrit, and then use that as the kind of linchpin and then bring in other, other fields as and when um, to, 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 to illustrate a point. Um, so what I'm saying is that Oriental studies becomes a profession at a particular point. And um, there've been lots of historians um, and, and sociologists writing about the rise of professions in the 19th century and the professionalization of academia. So I'm not going to get into that, but, um, what, but Oriental studies becomes a profession at, at a point when it, it, it essentially becomes uh, a kind of, it, it becomes recognized as a way of training people to enter into uh, a career. And those are um, Western Oriental scholars, but later also non-European scholars who take up Oriental studies. Um, and this is embedded within, the, within and, and contributory to the formation of what we think of as the Western university. Oriental studies becomes a discipline in um, in Oxford and Cambridge around the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. And this is the point at which most disciplines become disciplines in the sense of being um, fields which are studied within the university uh, with an examination system, with a curriculum. So this is when the modern university, as we understand it, is coming into being. Before that, you don't really have a structured uh, set of disciplines. Um, or as many as you, what you have is, you know, in Cambridge, you have basically mathematics as the main curriculum and in, in Oxford, it's, um, it's, it's humanities, but disciplinary formations start to take place in the 1860s and 70s. Um, and Oriental studies is particularly important because it's not, well, it's not just important in, in Britain and, 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 uh, and, and Oxford, but also within the United States. So in the United States, um, Oriental studies starts to become a field and a profession before almost any other professional field. Um, and you can see this if you look at Amer the history of American higher education and the history of American um, scholarship. Um, in the 1840s, um, the American Oriental Society is formed and American historians, intellectual historians, see the, the formation of, an, of a professional scholarly uh, body as one of the one of the first signs of the formation of a of a field. So, and then you have the formation of Oriental Studies and its and its foundation um, at Yale University, and then uh, Oriental Studies appearing in uh, in other universities, including Harvard, and then the new Johns Hopkins universities, universities which are leading in their field. And the reason why this happens in the United States at this point is because the United States is, is trying to create its own intellectual tradition and its own idea of a university. Um, and so, and, and, and they are, their idea of a university is coming primarily from the German model, which is this research model of a university. And that's where Americans go to get their training before they have training available in America. And so this is where it's coming from. And Oriental studies are very important in, in, in Germany. Um, at this point, which is Germany, which is already uh, a system of, of universities in a much more kind of developed sense than we have in the United States or in, or in, in the Anglo-American world. So Oriental studies is seen as, as uh, by the Americans as a prestigious field to introduce into their universities and as a way to, 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 um, to announce their presence to, um, to, to, to intellectual Europe. 
to European scholarship. Um, so that's sort of that's how Oriental studies emerges as a field in the United States in this moment of um, of of, of, identity, of of creating a national identity, of creating an intellectual identity, um, and of, of of creating prestigious research universities. In Britain, it's a slightly different field. But it's also happening at the time when you really get the first modern universities, because Oxford and Cambridge are medieval foundations. Um, they're the only universities in England until the 19th century, but in the 19th century, other universities start to start to, uh, to develop. But at the same time, Oxford and Cambridge also become modern universities. So in, our, in that sense, Oxford and Cambridge are about as old as UCL and the other universities, because they're not universities as we understand them in the modern day until that point. In Oxford, um, the the university, the, the uh, Sanskrit. So Oriental studies exists in the form of Arabic and Hebrew from um, the 16th centuries onwards. Um, and I, th I think it's the 16th centuries, but they don't exist as Oriental studies. They are basically forms of studying bi biblical um, comparative um, exegesis um, and looking at, 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 at Hebrew and Arabic. For, for a, a, a text for that reason. Whereas in the 19th century, Oriental studies is actually about Oriental literature and, and not about studying the Bible or primarily studying uh, biblical exegesis. Um, although that is the root of, of philology. In the 19th century, it's about Oriental studies as, as a growing field. And in Oxford, um, you have Arabic and Hebrew, but as I said, you don't have this idea of an Oriental studies until you really get to the second half of the 19th century. But what you do have is the introduction of Sanskrit. And that's really, I would say, the first point of, of Oriental studies as a field rather than of Hebrew and Arabic um, as, as kind of um, religious professorships for uh, divinity or connected with divinity in a sense. The, um, Oriental uh, Ox Sanskrit is introduced into Oxford by a man called Joseph Bowden, who was uh, and uh, worked for the East India Service in in the army, the East India Company in, in the army, and then he founds Sanskrit as a way of getting um, getting more people in India converted to Christianity. So his reasoning is that somebody in Oxford teaching Sanskrit will encourage young men. Um, young missionaries to learn Sanskrit um, at Oxford and then go to India and help convert Indians to Christianity. But when you get to the 19th century, the mid 19th century, something else has happened, which is that um, you've got the, the, the movement um, from, well, the, the, the East India Company is becoming, uh, from becoming, from being a kind of trading concern is becoming much more of, uh, of a ruling concern. And they are introducing a much more kind of structured and professionalized civil service. And one of the moves there is in 1855, they introduce um, or, or uh, the open competition in the Indian civil service. And that brings with it examinations. Um, and those examinations include Sanskrit and Arabic. And because the Indian civil service is a very seen as a very um, a good place for young men to have a career, um, and Oxford and Cambridge at this point, you know, it's basically, it's young men and it's young men who um, are often younger sons who aren't inheriting the, the land because, of, uh, because they've got older brothers. Um, this is another alternative career outside the church and the army. And of course, universities want their young men to get these jobs. And so Sanskrit gets introduced, Sanskrit and Arabic start getting introduced into places like uh, Trinity College Dublin and Edinburgh University for these reasons. Um, and so you have Sanskrit introduced and Oriental studies coming into being for, for a slightly different reason, part of which is, um, is, is an imperial ideal. It's an idealistic notion that they want to go out and rule empire and they want to do it in a way that uh, allows them to understand the people they're ruling culturally. Many of them think that this will allow them, they, they, they will then develop a sympathy with the people they're ruling and those people will then, you know, um, be more amenable to perhaps to being ruled. Um, but there's also inter-university rivalry. Oxford and Cambridge are always worried about, Cambridge is always worried about the fact that, mo you know, Oxford men are getting better jobs in the Indian civil service or more jobs in the Indian civil service. And then Oxford's worried about Cambridge drawing away men. So 
it becomes really important to have oriental studies, which is seen as an important as an exam that they can give and enter their ICS. Over time, it becomes less important within the Indian civil service, but it continues. What then continues to happen is that you start getting the influence of American and German um, interests in oriental studies, which are more research interests and about intellectual prestige. And so in Oxford and Cambridge, you have this parallel of, of um, going on where on the one hand, you have the older ideas and the, the ideas of um, colonial service and the importance of, sons of oriental studies to, colon to, to, to shoring up imperialism. Um, and on the other hand, you have these new ideas about, about the development of the university as a research um, as a research university, and these being prestigious and important research subjects, because, and I should have stated at this beginning, the reason why they're so important is because they are seen as key to philology, which is the study of language and the history of language, which is seen to be core to the understanding of um, the origins of the human race, and particularly the origins of Indo-Europeans, which of course uh, include Europeans and white Americans. Um, and so the, so Oriental studies is seen as a key, uh, and particularly Sanskrit, as a key to kind of opening up that uh, mysterious box. Um, so these, so, so essentially, once this happens, you start getting a different kind of attitude. So yes, you have the career in terms of the colonial administrators who are learning languages, but you also have the idea of a career of an academic, an academic uh, a professional academic who's going to study these languages and develop um, the field. And what, what occurs as a result of this is, um, is a different kind of, um, a different kind of environment for both Oriental studies and other disciplines. I'm not saying that Oriental studies are the only ones that professionalize in this, is the only subject that professionalizes in this way, but I am saying that it's one of the first to do this, um, right up there with history and modern languages it starts to be a, a, different, a, a different way of looking at study, a field of study, at a field of studies. Um, the other thing, and I'm just, I'm going to now start to start to, and start to kind of get to my closing points. Um, what we have now is that we have Oriental studies that are appearing in different universities at different times for different reasons. Um, but, if, uh, but eventually they're moving towards uh, kind of the, the way the the position they have in the modern university as an important discipline that helps people um, develop training for a particular job or purpose, a career. The the by the end of the nineteenth century, you start getting Indians, um, uh, people from Egypt, and basically for people from colonial uh, countries or places where Britain Britain has a colonial influence in Asia and Africa coming in um, to study in Britain. And the reason they're able to do so is because um, in because the reform of the universities in the 1850s and then in the 1870s, the uh, essentially what happens is that you no longer have to be Anglican to become a fellow um, of Oxford and Cambridge, which you had to be before then. And that was one of the reasons why UCL was formed because um, they, they, they opened up the possibility of non-Anglicans attending university. So you couldn't attend Oxford or Cambridge if you were Catholic, but you could, or, or a non-conformist, but you could attend UCL. So um, when this happens, you start having Asians and Africans and you need to find a way of letting them in. And one of the ways in which um, they are, they, well, they have to attend, they have to do entrance examinations just like everybody else, but the Oriental studies uh, the academics of the Oriental Studies uh, professors at Oxford and Cambridge argue that these people need to have an alternative to Latin and Greek, and that alternative needs to be an Oriental classical language. And so they decide what are the Oriental classical languages that are equivalent to Latin and Greek um, in an intellectual sense, um, as well as in a sense of being kind of um, rigorous enough to be testing these young men uh, in the way that Greek and Latin are seen to test them. And so in a sense, Sanskrit and Arabic then become tickets, ways of non-Europeans um, so non um, entering Oxford and Cambridge and also Edinburgh um, which, and, and other universities in the UK which start to follow suit. So the point that I'm making is that 
Oriental studies starts becoming not only a mean, uh, not only one of the kind of conduits to professionalization, but also conduit to, to conduit to diversity. And I think that those are the two things that underpin the modern university, two of the things, profession, uh, the professionalization of disciplines and diversity, growing diversity. And that diversity, as I said, Asians and Africans coming in, it becomes a ticket. Also, um, what you get at the end of the 19th century is also women coming into Oxford and Cambridge. And as women come in, they, um, some of these women um, are, come from wealthy families, they don't need to have professions, but many of them do. They, some of them do want to go become at professional academics, which means they have to earn money, which means they, they need jobs. And there aren't that many jobs in, in academia and certainly not in Oriental studies, which is still a small subject. And so what happens is that many of these women start to take up some of the more marginal languages, the less prestigious languages. So there's a hierarchy of languages, just as you know, classical studies in Greek and Latin are seen as the kind of the, 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 the core of a, of a humanities education, the core of an education for a gentleman, but eventually they start introducing things like modern history and modern languages for, you know, as, as people, as you have a more diverse student body. Similarly, they, they start to have other languages. And these women and women scholars like mm. Caroline Mary Ridding, Mary, uh, uh, Mabel Bode, Alice Werner, these are scholars, women scholars who take up languages that are not, um, they're not lionized by the men and that are not kind of dominated by the men. And as they do this, they start to push their fields and increase the diversity of Oriental languages in, uh, in the universities. I won't go into details because I'm, I know that I'm kind of going over my time, but the, I want to give one last example of diversity because the other thing that happens is of course, as of course Asian and Africans come and they come from other countries and they, they go to Oxford and Cambridge, but they're also in Oxford and Cambridge, they're encountering other people and they're encountering other ideas. And some of these are ideas they may have already developed while they were in the countries they came from, but they're able to consolidate them and build new networks. And they use these networks for anti-colonial purposes. So you, in 1907, there's a document in the University Archives um, uh, which talks about uh, a case that's taken to the university solicitors where they want to change the criteria for the Bowdoin, Schol Bowdoin scholarships, which are basically Sanskrit scholarships, um, in order to prevent Indians from getting those scholarships. Um, because they say that Indians come and use those scholarships to attend Oxford and Cambridge, get all the advantages, and then go back and foster sedition in their country. Um, and they actually change it for this reason. They, they're able to change it, although the solicitors are very cautious about you know, saying, look, you can't make it very clear. You know, you've got to change the rules in a way that, that doesn't make that wildly evident that you're going to kind of prevent Indians from getting this. But they're not the only people. I mean, these Bowdoin scholars are not the only people. You have other people coming. So also, and, and so Oriental studies becomes another means of challenging the status quo. And again, increasing the diversity and the complexity and the complexion in more than one way of the university. Um, and essentially, in a way, this is a reversal of the kind of Disraelian dream, isn't it? Because instead of domination of the East, you have, I mean, you have domination of the East, perhaps, but as, as along with it, you have the kind of intellectual opening up of the West. So that's my paper. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Just saying thank you very much, Mishka. Mishka it was really a really fascinating paper and a, a long historical span and many different careers that um, Orientalism has, has embodied at different times. I'm sure people have a lot of uh, questions. As I say, if you do have questions, please just put them in the chat. We'll, come to, we'll do all the questions at the end once we've uh, been through all the talks. Um, so the next speaker is Siobhan Daly. <coughs> And Siobhan, as I said at the start, is a co-organizer um, of this series, and she's currently a student on the MST in Literature and Arts at the University of Oxford. She has an MA from King's College London and the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in Text and Performance, as well as a BA in English and History from Goldsmiths College, University of London. And she has an interest in post-colonialism and Oxford's influence on empires. I'm sure we're going to find out more about in her talk on Gertrude Bell from Oxford to Empire. Over to you, Siobhan. Thanks so much, Ben. 
I wanted to say hello and thank you so much for joining us today. As Ben said, I'm Siobhan Daly. I'm studying at the University of Oxford and today I'm going to be talking on Gertrude Bell from Oxford to Empire, which covers some of my early research and personal interest in the subject. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Ben Grant for asking me to co-organise this conference with him and for giving me the opportunity to participate in this fantastic project. It's down to Ben's vision for the conference that we're all here today, and I'm personally very grateful to him for his support and encouragement. A thank you to you to Dr. Mr. Kassina for such an engaging talk. I really enjoyed it and it's given me lots to think about. When thinking about the title for this series, Oxford and Empire, Travel and Translation, there was only one personality who immediately sprung to mind for me, someone who had studied at Oxford, been a hugely influential and politically active part of the British Empire, been a prodigious traveller and active in the works of translation from the poetry of Hafiz to recording Hittite inscriptions in Bimba Khalees. So who was this woman? Where did she come from? What were her motivations? Why should any of us be interested in her? Her career was wide ranging and I won't be able to touch on all of it today, but I'd like to give an overview of her life at Oxford and in the Empire, a few stories, thoughts and space for discussion and continued conversations. Gertrude Bell was one of the first women to graduate from Oxford with a first in modern history, sharing that honour with Alice Drayton Greenwood of Somerville Hall in 1888. She'd been a mountaineer with an alpine peak named after her. She was a pioneer in using photography along with a theodolite to inform her cartography and using all of these modern techniques to complement her work in archaeology, skills and information that would be beneficial later in her work for British intelligence. She undertook strenuous treks throughout the Arabian desert, was a key part in the Arab Bureau and later instrumental in establishing a new country in the region, Iraq, along with a new king, Faisal. Yet as ahead of her time as she sounds, she was an active and vocal anti-suffragist, someone who was very much a dutiful daughter of the empire. It's easy to pour adulation on Bell and superlatives onto her life, but this is uncritical and simplistic. Edward Said offered a new paradigm through which to think about Bell when he describes her and incidentally her fellow Oxford historian T. Lawrence as the British agent orientalist who during and after World War I took over both the role of expert adventurer eccentric and the role of colonial authority whose position is in a central place next to the indigenous ruler. You have only to think about Bell and Faisal here. Said famously describes Orientalism as a Western style for dominating, restructuring and having authority over the Orient. Activities in which both of these Oxford historians, including other significant alumni such as Gertrude's good friend D.G. Hogarth of Magdalen, would be wholly proactively involved. Hogarth actually wrote a book called The Penetration of Arabia, and of course there's a lot to say about the sexualization of the East in that, but surprisingly he openly notes that the content isn't even based on his own observations, which supports Said's comment that the Orient as such became less important than what the Orientalist made of it. Gertrude Bell was born into immense privilege and wealth with significant political and social connections through her family of ironwork manufacturers, whose financial prowess had established the family as one of the richest in the country. Much of their steel was exported for use in the development of the transport infrastructures within the British Empire. This family sense of importance to the empire and of the empire was ingrained into their sense of self. Encouraged at school by Mr. Cramb, a distinguished and inspiring teacher to apply to Oxford, her stepmother Florence noted that the time had not yet come when it was a usual part of a girl's education to go to university and it was with some qualms that we consented. Gertrude came up to Oxford at the end of April 1886 to Lady Margaret Hall or LMH as we call it. Janet Courtney, sister of Hogarth, was there at the same time as Gertrude and describes her as the most brilliant creature who ever came amongst us. She reports that Gertrude was annoyed when the Bodley's librarian refused her a ticket to the Radcliffe on the ground that she was not yet an honour student. She never could pass him in the street afterwards without wanting to shake her fist at him. As Janet rightly observes, she had been so little used to encountering obstacles. Her forceful sense of self-entitlement and a wish to transcend boundaries was already in evidence and will continue to be seen throughout her life. Whilst her family had benefited financially from the empire with their steel export, Gertrude would now find herself at the intellectual heart of the empire. The subject that Gertrude chose to study modern history had only been taught at Oxford since the 1850s. Its aim was to strengthen and perpetuate the traditional values of liberal education 
beginning with the fall of Rome and concluding in the 18th century, history was not an innovative or experimental study of recent issues and events. Instead, the his study of history began and continued as an epic illustration of the qualities required of England's governing elite, perfect for future civic administrators. It's interesting to note what the curriculum looked like and what the tutors thought was the essential grounding and reading for the empire's future leaders. In a letter to her parents, Gertrude gives a glimpse into this and tells them, for example, that she is reading the third volume of Stubbs. Stubbs is William Stubbs, founder of the School of History and Regis Professor from 1866 to 1884. The book is The Constitutional History of England, a historical synthesis which contains dubious analysis such as, it is true, more or less, of the whole of our early history. The march of constitutional progress is so steady and definite as to suggest everywhere the idea that it was guided by some great creative genius or some great directive tradition or it suggests trusting that the victory of light and truth is drawing nearer every day. You can see where some of his students got their delusions of grandeur from. What he is presenting as fact is what he believes to be the progression of English history towards an astounding future. The Regis professor during Gertrude's time was E.A. Freeman, who saw the past as a universal great drama dominated by heroes, English obviously, while contemporaries held him as an epic poet who wrote history as romance. But history as romance is a large part of the problem here. The students were not encouraged in critical thinking and both the curriculum and the examinations excluded contemporary scholarship, historiography and evaluations of historical method and meaning. They were given a reading of national history that confirmed and justified their elitist place within society. The tutors valued strong moral national character, essential in their view for servants of the empire. Between her family and the School of History, Gertrude would be convinced both of her intellectual importance and her duty to contribute to the nation. Her two years at Oxford had certainly increased her intellectual confidence. During her viva, she clashed with her examiner, Professor S. R. Gardiner, the leading authority on the early Stuart period, according to Janet Courtney, by telling him, I fear I don't quite agree with your view of Charles I, which apparently flustered him so greatly, he hastily handed her on to his next colleague. In 1908, Hugh Edgerton, the late professor of colonial history said, just because much is demanded of her, Oxford may be able to rise to the heights of the future opened out and become the nursing mother of the elect of the kindred people. It is an attitude that it is hard not to see in the work of her, of Gertrude, her patrician condescension, a founding mother of a brown new state, Iraq, and her nurturing of the monarchy fashioned after Great Britain, fueled by lessons learned at Oxford. Bell was firmly of the empire. Following her completion of her studies, Florence's sister, Lady Lascelles, had begged Florence to send Gertrude to stay with them for the winter, opining that frequenting foreign diplomatic society might be a help for Gertrude to get rid of her Oxfordy manner. She doesn't qualify exactly what that means, but it was with her Oxfordy manner that Gertrude set off into the world. Along the way, she wrote a number of books traversing archeology, span travel and administration. And there's not time today to cover everything. So I'll just touch on a few points. In her book, The Desert and the Sown, an account of her travels through Lebanon, Syria and Palestine in 1905, she reveals much about herself behind her formal language. Her learned prejudices shine through in her condescending judgments of the people she encounters on her journey. She's casually racist, describing Jericho as an unromantic village wherein the only Arabs a tourist ever comes to know, a base born stock half bred with Negro slaves. When she's assisted by a local man helping her to gather wood for her evening fire, rather than say thank you, she describes him as a gray haired Negro, a cheery soul, untroubled by the consideration that he was one of the most preposterously misshapen human beings. Layering onto this, she puts on top her class prejudice, denouncing her cook before she sacked him for speaking Arabic with the vulgar cockney of Jerusalem, a language bereft of dignity. She hires muleteers and finds dissatisfaction with the Druze. This is an Arabic speaking esoteric ethno religious group. The man is shambling, incurably lazy, greedy, and rather stupid. She doesn't shy from physical violence to impose submission. She objects to him drinking arak, so she takes a hunting crop to him. He has a lustrous eye that looked forth unblinking like the eye of a dog. 
nonchalantly dehumanising the man and likening him to an animal. She introduces him by his religion, creates his unflattering picture of him and leaves his actual name, Muhammad, until last, an act of aggression and contempt. Her language and imagery is that of dehumanisation and violence. It's the opposite of personification and by contrast, Gertrude likes to say how she became a person. She refers to herself in this way and it's quite different. She positions herself as socially superior and regal. She says that a woman should be known to come of a great and honoured stock whose customs are inviolable is her best claim to consideration. Her cook refers to her as your excellency, but it is worth asking who told him to address her as such and why she didn't correct him. Why did she think she ought to be addressed as your excellency? Well, what we're seeing here is her sense of, um, her unquestioning sense of superiority. I recently heard Gertrude and Lawrence described as the uncrowned king and queen of the desert. It's a rose tinted, romantically historicized imperial populist view of them. A monarch requires a kingdom and citizenship of that land. And at a basic level, neither of them had that. They were, were the same construct placed upon the UK. One would instinctively feel the nonsense of that statement. It also speaks to this attitude of the Middle East as being an open space awaiting categorization and occupation. That you might say the people of the desert called her queen, but the primary reference for this is in a letter from Gertrude to her father. So it's not an independent source and it aligns with her own avowed aim of letting everyone know she's from honored stock. Her misrepresentation of herself gained her valuable access to tribal leaders, which later proved useful to British gain. It reminds me of another Oxford student, Richard Burton, who would misrepresent himself as a doctor to gain access to a harem or as a Muslim, famously, to gain access to Mecca. Following an incident where a group of Gertrude's group had avoided 900 soldiers, she delights that from that day, my star was recognised as a lucky one. She already believes herself to be special. What she is pleased with is others recognising her as such. Professor Linda Tuiwai Smith gives us a framework to understand the work of imperialists, and it's useful to quote her here. She says, it galls us that Western researchers and intellectuals can assume to know all that is possible of us on the basis of their brief encounters with some of us. It appalls us that the West can desire, extract and claim ownership of our ways of knowing, our imagery, the things we create and produce, and then simultaneously reject the people who created and developed those ideas and seek to deny them further opportunities to be creators of their own culture and nations. According to Edward Said, this process worked partly because of the constant interchange between the scholarly and imaginative constructions about the Orient, which makes statements about the Orient, authorizing views of it, describing it, teaching it, settling it and ruling over it. This can clearly be seen, for example, in the work of the Arab Bureau, which Bell, Hogarth and Lawrence were all part of. Well, Gertrude Bell was no doubt impressive. She came from a position of privilege and wealth which enabled her to have the opportunities that she had, the space to write and think, a room of her own, the money to buy books or attend school, funding from her father for her extensive desert travels, the wealth to buy gifts to impress the people she encountered along the way. Janice, Janet Howarth makes this point in her book, In Oxford, but not of Oxford, the women's colleges, saying, Early historians of women's colleges were perhaps too ready to give them credit for the achievements of alumni whose advantages came chiefly from the families into which they were born or married. She also makes a great point that Bell was not alone in being an LMH traveller or a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. There was Suzette Taylor, who was at LMH from 1884 to 1886, admitted as a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society in 1913 at the same time as Bell and worked in naval intelligence for the Admiralty or Ella Sykes, who was at LMH from 1881 to 1883, who published Through Persia on a Side Saddle and was another 1913 RGS fellow. Interestingly, Sykes, also immersed in the Oxford tradition, would write, I consider that it is an imperial work to help girls of high stamp to seek their fortunes beyond the seas, women who will care for our glorious flag and what it signifies. It is not too much to say that a British woman worthy of her great heritage can be, in very deed, a missionary for the empire. In leaving the nursing mother of the elect at Oxford, they were all academics who were educated in and believed such things. Gertrude was not extraordinary amongst this group of women, but very much part of them. 
They left Oxford and actively participated in the building of empire through their research and work. So should we be interested in her? The application of her education through her writings and work for the empire has left a legacy that still remains for us today. And that for us as academics is worth reflecting on. Ultimately, Gertrude wasn't the queen of anything and history is not about one British success after another. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siobhan, and thank you for your kind words um, at the start. Very polemical paper, I thought. It tied in well with uh, Mishka's about the, the role of women and how the East could be a, a career for women in perhaps different ways uh, from men. But yeah, I think it's a fascinating tie, which we can maybe discuss um, later on in the discussion. Um, so next up then is Elizabeth Grass. So Elizabeth is a DPhil student in the History Faculty at the University of Oxford and she holds an AHRC Collaborative Doctoral Award with the National Trust. Through the prism of the country estate, her research focuses on the socio-cultural activities of West Indian slaveholders in Britain in the 18th century. It offers perspectives on wealth derived from enslaved labour and its legacy in our built environment. Elizabeth works closely with the Colonial Countryside Initiative and has given presentations and training to staff and volunteers in the heritage sector. A rare book specialist by profession, she is particularly interested in the colonial dimensions of collecting and in the Country House Library as a repository of imperial knowledge. And Thank Elizabeth you. is talk, sorry, Elizabeth is talking about Oxford, Palmyra and the West Indies. Thanks, Ben. Thank you for the introduction and, and for organising. And thanks also to Torch um, for hosting this. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, just a moment. Hopefully this. Ben, if you could give the thumbs up that this has worked. Um, can you see that? I can see it. Yeah, it's not it's not on the slideshow, but. Right, yeah. I think we're there, thank you. Um, so my presentation today, and I will actually just turn my video off as well for the sake of streaming. My presentation today um, tackles an earlier time period than those we've been hearing from, from Misha, Mishka and Siobhan. Um, and it's really a case study to consider the intersection of Oxford empire nationalism and antiquarianism in the middle decades of the 18th century. These, oh, how do I, sorry about this, won't seem to, <laughs> these, I should say, marble fragments um, are part of the permanent collection at the Ashmolean Museum. They're part of a group which originally came from Greece, Turkey and Syria, kind of mixed origin, and perhaps unexpectedly, they provide a link in a chain which runs from Western Asia to the fringes of the British Empire in the Caribbean. The marbles form part of what is known as the Dawkins Bequest and were don donated to the university at the end of the 1750s by one Henry Dawkins. Dawkins donated the marbles in honour of his elder brother James, who had died in 1757, and who had collected the marbles whilst on a major tour of what is now Turkey, Syria, Egypt and Greece in the late 1740s. Collected is obviously a freighted term here and I'll be returning to its implications in this context, but in essence they were gathered in situ from various places in Eastern Europe and Western Asia by a young man on his travels, and when he died, they were donated by his brother to the University of Oxford, uh, the brothers alma mater. These are the brothers. Uh, Henry and James Dawkins were young men of fashion. They were landowners and connoisseurs. They were also born in Jamaica as heirs to a major plantation and slaveholding dynasty. In 1744, the brothers inherited from their father what comprised the third largest landholding on Jamaica, an island that was already considered the jewel in the crown of British West Indian possessions, thanks to its unparalleled sugar production. And as Ben suggested at the beginning, I'm interested in these kinds of men, how they fashion themselves and, and the ways in which they uh, transmuted uh, funds from exploitation right at the fringes of empire to kind of respectability in the metropole. 
And actually the vast majority of the men in my study attended university at either Oxford or Cambridge. And I think that's quite interesting in itself, um, not least because through their peer groups, we can often trace the beginnings of networks which they utilized in later social and commercial life, not unlike the way that university operates even in the present day. In the case of James and Henry Dawkins, however, their attachments to Oxford, uh, that's county, city and university, were multivalent. The connections began in their youth when, like most children of wealthy slaveholders, they were dispatched from the Caribbean to receive an education in Britain. An English education was considered essential by West Indian parents who wished, as John Pinney notably articulated, for their children to be thought of as, quote, true born Englishmen. When Pinney stated that he wanted his son to be, quote, no West Indian, he revealed that an English education was intended to compensate for the perceived disadvantages of a Caribbean upbringing. And here are just a couple of satires, um, because West Indians, much like the Indian nabobs, were a distinct pilloried and satirised type, even quite early in the 18th century, and they became a locus for anxieties around empire, around miscegenation, around effeminacy and sort of foreign corruption more generally. Um, and it's worth saying here that these anxieties predated growing metropolitan unease with transatlantic slavery, but only hardened as the abolitionist movement gathered pace. So trusted contacts were relied upon to find suitable British schools for these children. And in the case of the Dawkins, it was their uncle, their father's brother, also called James, who had a country estate at Over Norton, just outside Chipping Norton, um, obviously in Oxfordshire. James acted in loco parentis for his nephews and they were enrolled at Abingdon School, obviously be familiar with it also in Oxfordshire, one of England's oldest public schools. Um, and afterwards they moved from there to St John, College at the University of Oxford. But even after graduation, Oxford remained an important focal point for the family, and this ossified when their uncle's house at Overnorton passed to Henry in 1766. Now I should say here there's been a lot of really superb work, particularly lately, that's been done on the way that imperial families operated, and they were kind of uh, characterised by the staging of extended family members in different parts of the imperial world, who then took care of different aspects of the family business. For example, in the Metropole, this role might include becoming an MP to lobby for what was known as the West India interest. In other words, to lobby for favorable trade policy and later to inveigh against the abolition of slavery. We see this in action with the Dawkins family when after university, the brothers Henry and James experience bifurcated. Henry returned to Jamaica, where he took up plantation management and a number of official and ceremonial roles within the island's legislature. James remained in Britain, bought a country estate near Southampton, became an MP and developed a serious interest in travel. James had already undertaken the traditional grand tour to Italy, but he quickly got in with a crowd of wealthy young aristocrats who were beginning to see the grand tour as increasingly passé. They exhibited a kind of louche, been there, done that attitude and began to speak of the, quote, lure of the East. In the East, by which they meant areas under the dominion of the Ottoman Empire, they saw the potential for adventure and sexual exploit, as well as fertile ground for architectural and artistic inquiry. The Grand Tour was also being seen as increasingly problematic, with accusations that it was encouraging effeminate behaviour and foreign tastes. As these were exactly the kind of sentiments which were also attached to West Indians like James Dawkins, it is obvious why Eastern travel appealed to him. At the end of the 1740s then, he funded a trip to what he called Egypt via the Levant, which must have been extremely costly since it almost immediately became contemporary shorthand for lavish expenditure. Dr. Johnson, who was of course a vocal opponent of slavery, is quoted as saying, the only great instance that I have ever known of the enjoyment of wealth was that of Jamaica Dawkins, who, going to visit Palmyra and hearing that the way was infested by robbers, hired a troop of Turkish horse to guard him. When the expedition was complete and, and Dawkins returned, he also funded the publication of an illustrated folio volume, The Ruins of Palmyra, otherwise Tedmore in the Desert, which was hugely influential and which cemented Dawkins' career and reputation as a connoisseur. 
It included a written account by his traveling companion, Robert Wood, of the journey to Palmyra and the remains which they asserted they had discovered there, along with detailed schematic plates taken from drawings of the site, which crucially could be emulated by architects. And here's an example here. Indeed, architecturally and in terms of publishing history, the book's importance in the mid 18th century is difficult to overstate. Its empirical methodology had a radical influence on Britain's architectural landscape, and it became a major catalyst for the second wave of neoclassicism, sometimes called the Greek Revival, by which connoisseurs rejected Palladian and Vitruvian models, i.e. those models refracted through Rome, in favour of empirical studies in the Greco and Greco-Roman world. Following the publication of the ruins of Palmyra, the middle of the century then saw a rash of Palmyrene motifs showing up in country houses and follies around the country, arguably the apotheosis of which is Robert Adams' design for the drawing room ceiling at Osterley Park, uh, which you can see here. This is the ceiling and this is the plate in the book from which he derived the design. There was even a Palmyra screen at Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens lifted directly from the book, although sadly its likeness has been lost. The book was also widely praised in Oxford academic circles, as is evidenced by a letter sent from John Swindon at Christ Church in 1754, where he writes, quote, several copies of the ruins of Palmyra have reached Oxford towards the close of December 1753 one of which was purchased by the Reverend Mr. Godwin, fellow of Balliol College, a gentleman of great learning and an eminent tutor of that house. As, at his invitation, I looked over with him the finished plates, exhibiting to our view those noble remains of antiquity, which gave both of us infinite pleasure and delight. So it's clear from the various receptions of the book that it was considered a marvel of British, quote, discovery, bringing, quote, lost Palmyra to England, the book was instantly cast in a patriotic light and became a site over which national stereotypes and expectations were rehearsed and played out, with Horace Walpole calling it a noble book and elsewhere making it clear he didn't think the French could have done such a good job. Dawkins, a man from the fringes of empire, had successfully co-opted himself into a nationalist sentiment in which Britain had taken ownership of Palmyra, and really nowhere is this more evident than in this vast history painting, which he commissioned from Gavin Hamilton, an artist based in Rome. And um, I've written on this end elsewhere, I don't have time to dwell on it now, but I think we can all agree, it's just um, an Orient, a pure Orientalist confection. I mean, we have Dawkins in wood emerging from a jungle scene at dawn, so you've got the kind of programmatic light of discovery. They're wearing togas, which of course they wouldn't have been wearing. And then there's this kind of, um, incomprehension on the faces of the Turkish guard, just setting themselves up um, against existing racist stereotypes. And that, not to mention the enslaved African figure foregrounded as I think what we can all agree is a signifier of Dawkins Caribbean fortune. So the presentation of the tour, the presentation of the tour as a discovery, uh, like the painting, um, is a complete fallacy. So it's not only have European merchants and traders um, visited and even published on Palmyra, but it was of course also an inhabited settlement. Um, the town of Tadmor, and there is a recent uh, brilliant article in the Journal of Hellenic Studies, which makes the case for calling the site Tadmor Palmyra continuously um, in acknowledgement of its long um, use as a settlement, was long established and, and was thriving. Dawkins and Wood's disregard of this, uh, their privilege only the classical past, is evident both in the book and in expedition diaries, which are held in London. Between the book and the diaries, it's possible to, to kind of pin down the acquisitions of those, the acquisition of those marbles, which are now at the Ashmolean. The book cheerfully notes, quote, that the men, that the men, quote, carried off the marbles whenever it was possible, end quote. They were often forcibly taken against the wishes of the indigenous people there, as noted by Wood, who commented, quote, the avarice and superstition of the inhabitants make our task difficult and sometimes impracticable, end quote, by which he means the task of taking the marbles. The resistance they encountered indeed may explain the sorry state of some of the marbles, which have obviously been quite rudely chipped from larger blocks. 
So through these actions, James Dawkins had succeeded in cementing a reputation in both the world of the drunken London clubhouse and in the cloisters and quadrangles of Oxford University. Oxford academic and traveller Thomas Shaw was positively glowing in his approbation, describing Dawkins as, quote, a name as dear to all lovers of la virtu as the elegant owner of it is an ornament to society, end quote. The now defunct quality of la, la virtu was aspired to by connoisseurs and was considered, quote, an essential moral state, timeless and ideal, which found its finest embodiment in the British nobility. The nationalistic sentiment um, framed Dawkins as noble British explorer and elided the troubling and effeminate stereotype of the West Indian. And James was still basking in this reputation when he returned to Jamaica in 1757 and when he died there shortly afterwards aged 36. At this point, and as further evidence of the structure of the imperial family and its need for and its need for dispersal and the way in which it worked to kind of control um, and manage power across the imperial world, Henry Dawkins moved to the UK from Jamaica to carry James's mantle. One of the first things he did was donate the marbles from the Palmyra expedition to the university in a canny move which further cemented the Dawkins name and which garnered association with one of the foundational collections of the Ashmolean, the Arundel marbles. The final tranche of the Arundel marbles had been donated to the museum in 1755 by the Countess of Pomfret, yet another, and yet another celebratory folio, as you can see here, the Marmora Oxoniensia, published in 1763, celebrates uh, the recent um, donations of marbles. And in it, the Dawkins name appears alongside a Latin encomium. Uh, I haven't shown it here, but there's a quite a lengthy encomium to James Dawkins' great voyage, Henry Dawkins' great grief at the loss of his brother and both brothers' great generosity in gifting their fines to the university. Henry settled into a life as a country gentleman, uh, a West Indian plantation owner and a pro-slavery politician. When his uncle died in 1766, he took on and expanded the Oxfordshire estate at Overnorton. And I'm very grateful here for the work of James Dawkins um, the current James Dawkins, an academic from UK, UCL who studied the Dawkins as landowners and found that Henry expanded and enclosed the land at Overnorton in a move which led to anti-enclosure riots in the late 1760s. Through these actions, Henry made concrete changes to the landscape of rural Oxfordshire and his legacy is now most visible in the mausoleum he established at St Mary's Church, Chipping Norton, which takes full advantage of contemporary funerary stylings makes no mention of Jamaica and is a neat coda to the transformation of this family from imperial outliers to established members of the provincial gentry. So just to conclude, the marbles and the activities of the Dawkins brothers suggest the need for a holistic and biographical assessment of university collections. The Dawkins bequest illustrates two phenomena. The first speaks to the problematic genesis of the museum, and, it, and that's the acquisitive tendency with, in which artifacts from the East are placed in the self-appointed intellectual spaces of the quote West. The second is that Oxford was a proving ground for imperial careers, a staging post for respectability and the repository of colonial collections throughout the 18th century. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was great. I think it, was, it, it tied it very well again with the, the other papers. We're going back to that sort of pre-Orientalist uh, period that Mishka was talking about before it became a, consolidated as a, as a kind of profession, the Orientalist. But I mean, you could see that was very much tied to their careers and their identities um, as well. I love the togas. <laughs> completely mad. <laughs> OK, well, shall we open it up to discussion then? Um, let's see if we're we'd like to talk about it. I think, Mishka, I was interested in what you were saying about the anti-colonial networks that were established through um, Orientalism in Oxford. I was wondering if you could give us some examples of that. Was Oriental Studies a site for particular anti-colonial careers and endeavours um, in the later period? Um, I think that I think that it's um, there. There are two particular figures I'm thinking about, um, who were anti-colonial figures and uh, made the university quite worried. Um, but in, in, to answer your general question, um, it's not. 
no, many of these people who came and who got into uh, um, universities in, in, in the UK by having entrance exams in Sanskrit or Arabic were coming here to study other things. Um, so that's one thing that should be remembered, that there's a distinction between people who do, say, the Tripos and Oriental Studies at Cambridge or, um, or Oriental take um, the language of the, the, the literae in Dikai is what was called uh, for a time in the 19th century here. Um, and then the people who kind of do do it just as an entrance exam. Um, I think that what I was trying to say is that because of, because um, Oriental studies became a point of access, it's it became a kind of portal to um, other kinds of ways of um, challenging the status quo. Um, but the two figures I was thinking of do both happen to be doing both were Sanskritists, um, and they're both in the late nineteenth well. One is in the late late 19th, early 20th century, the other one's in Oxford from the early 20th century. Um, uh, the second one is was at St. John's. Um, his name was Lala Hardeal. Um, and he um came as the Bowden, he was a very obviously very good scholar, clearly, and he came as a Bowden scholar. Um, so he had a, a scholarship and he also had an exhibition, a, a prize um at St. John's. But then he gave up his uh his scholarship uh, after two years for ideological reasons. And he went on to um, become this anti-colonial activist. He traveled a lot and then he ended up in California where he was actually a lecturer for a while. He then came back to the UK and got a PhD from SOAS. But he, while he was in California, he was um, uh, a founder of something called the Ghadar movement, which was this um, movement of Punjabi farmers in California, um, a, a kind of anti-colonial movement. So what he was trying to do was uh, collect expatriate uh, 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 Indians um, kind of anti-colonials and to kind of generate uh, anti-colonial activism amongst them and anti-colonial opinion. But while he was at Oxford, he one of the reasons why he became um, even more, uh, you know, perhaps he already had these ideas, but his 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 ideas were strengthened by connection with someone called Shamji Krishna Varma, who was the assistant to the Bowdoin professor Monia Williams in the 19th century. Um, Muni Williams died at the end of the 19th century, um, and Shamji Krishna Verma was uh, again a very uh, a very good Sanskritist. And I also know something that, I, that because I I've looked at the archives that UCL almost hired him as a professor. They they had a job search. They had a I call it a job search. They 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 had they advertised a job um, in Oriental Studies at UCL in the late 19th century, um, which Shamji Krishna Verma applied for, and then. So it says there's this, you know, so there's application process and then it says, uh, you know, we think that it should be given, this is from the committee, this is a committee's decision. And we think this job should be given to Shamji Krishna Varma, he's the most qualified. And then there's a red line through it. And then it says, we've decided to postpone this for a year and it's been, um, it's going to be offered on a temporary basis to somebody who's already there and who's teaching something else. Um, it's not clear why this is, but it may be because he's suspected uh, of uh, his his political ideologies are are, are questionable. With Hadeal, it's clear to me because the the document I talked about in the university archive, which is this um, university solicitor solicitor sort of um, giving their advice on what to do about the Bowdoin scholarship, is um, exactly around the time that Hadeal is at Oxford, um, which is 1900 and I think 1905, 1904 and five, and 1905 and six. Um, and what happens then is that they get involved in this uh, assassination of a man called Curzon Wiley um, in, in London. And this, is an, and this is done through instigating a student. Um, there's a kind of student protest within this, this place called India House in London, which is where all the students, Indian students live. And they kind of um, end up, you know, uh, fermenting this, this, uh, this whole kind of Revolutionary, revolutionary kind of atmosphere, and then the the assassination, um, and so there's a uh, yeah, there's definitely a, a a connected line there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, yeah, it's really interesting. There's wider networks within Britain as well in London, and so as India House, um, and so on, and extending to India, and yeah, some global uh, connections tying into Oxford. Well, let's uh, open it up. Some of the questions uh, that are coming in on the chat. So I think. Um, the question here for uh, Siobhan, which is asking that 
Gertrude is preceded by a somewhat different and in some respects more admirable woman traveller observer, namely, namely Mary Kingsley. Is there any evidence that Gertrude knew of Mary Kingsley's adventures and achievements? I suppose, you know, you could address a wider question as well as the question of women travellers and you know, where Gertrude fits um, in relation to that. Uh, yes, she did know Mary Kingsley. Uh, I saw the question come in and I had a quick look around and there's a letter where she talks about, which I'll just find for you, she talks about having dinner with Mary and she says that, um, she's writing to her mum and she says that her dinner last night was impayable. She's at uh, some people from the French embassy and she says that Miss Kingsley was dressed entirely in African clothes, I should think. So yes, she did know of her and actually she met her. So, I, I, But I think also, she would have known about these types of people anyway I was thinking of people like Hester Stanhope or Isabella Bird so yeah she she definitely I mean thank you for the question she did know about her and she met her so but that's the only reference I could find just the one so how, how do you think that that Gertrude Bell fits in relation to the, the women travelers and that the kind of genre of um, travel travel writing and you know, the ways in which travel literature was important for women to, to create identities for themselves, I suppose, um, in this period. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question and one that I've not really focused on because it's not the focus of my research and where I'm interested in Oxford and Empire. But it is um, when she writes, she definitely takes a masculine tone she really positions herself quite differently to other female writers and um, she's her language is never passive I actually my, my talk was much longer than it was and I took out a lot on how she describes herself and uses like this kind of masculine language um, but I think she'd probably see herself more along the lines of somebody like Burton actually than mm -hmm. somebody like I don't know Hester Stanhope or Mary Kingsley. Yeah no it's interesting that you know you, you seeing her very much I think is, is a perform quite a male role but also seeing herself as a mother um you know in relation to um, you know it is really is. interesting it is I mean she was at the start I mean how she find, how she negotiates her her different roles how she can sometimes like use her femininity um not in a sexual way I think she tries quite hard to just use whatever access she can as a woman but she's also fighting quite hard to be seen in this like masculine way and to be taken seriously um she does do that a lot and she does ne negotiate that a lot and in a way for a woman who does come from such a privileged background I feel when I read that she's almost like always demanding her way into these spaces that she does feel that she's entitled to be there so she's never going to let her sex stop her from being in those spaces and she does use her intellect to get in there and she ends up obviously employed by the British government which was quite unusual for for any woman at that time at the height of power that she got to and and yeah you're right you know seeing herself as a, as a mother um, of a new of an entirely new country but I think some of that comes from her work at Oxford where it, the school of history really educated people into being civic administrators so they really were imbued with this sense of like the empire's greatness and they weren't really taught to ever question that so I think it just it, it really comes from her education I think she fundamentally believed that she was progressing the whole of humanity through her work it's this sense of um you know the British the, I, this is what I was talking about with Stubbs you know the sense of the British being further ahead on this line of progression the Arabs being behind them so they were trying to help them by bringing them along on their way towards a, a greater sense of civilization. Thank you. Mishka you wanted to come in? Yeah I just wanted to say uh, Siobhan that it's, it's interesting you know what you're saying about Gertrude Bell but it's also true I think of, of people at, at Oxford and Cambridge that they are they see that they are seen and see themselves as pioneers, as heroic figures, mm. um, and and I'm and I'm saying this very particularly. The, I use the word heroic because um, there are two figures uh, in Oriental studies who have who use that appellation. So one of them is is, is the, one of these Sanskritist women that I talked about, Caroline Mary Ridding, um, who is described by one of her contemporaries. Uh, so this is she's one of the first generation of you know women to study at at, at Cambridge, and uh, her contemporary and friend who's writing after uh, Dridding's death, writes about how she sees her first of Girton in this kind of um, gray or brown outfit with this white shawl walking round and round and composing a Greek or Latin prose um, and how she's determined to be different. And her description, this um, the woman's description of Ridding is as a heroic soul. 
and she describes as a heroic soul because she, um, you know, she has to make her own way in life. And then she, you know, makes this career in Orientalism. And, you know, so that's very admirable for her in Oriental studies, sort of this kind of intellectual heroism. And um, as a parallel to that, the, the professor of Sanskrit at Cambridge, uh, the first professor of Sanskrit at Cambridge, uh, E.B. Cowell, who actually bridges this idea of a, of a kind of older amateur Orientalism, uh, which was often learned by colonial administrators in India, um, and the kind of professionalized Orientalism, because he actually has a bit of both. Cowell, when he gets the professorship, is described by his brother as a utilitarian hero. Um, you know, as somebody who's going to kind of um, intellectually lead uh, Britain um, in this heroic enterprise of what, uh, conquering the Orient in different ways. Yeah, I came, it's really interesting you should say that, Mish, because I came across that quite a lot when I was looking at the historians that um, the School of History was teaching. So people like Stubbs, they, they were often looking and lamenting the lack of heroes and heroic statesmen. So that's so interesting, because it's exactly the word I just kept coming up against. And it reminded me, um, T. Lawrence's thesis was obviously on um, Crusader castles. And I think the whole, um, it would have been part of their education learning about the Crusades. And I, I think that has so much to answer for, but it's this romantic, Cell, a sense of you know the great Christian uh, crusader going off into the Middle East and like reclaiming these spaces and just being so heroic and as you mentioned like Tancred and I was reading The Talisman recently uh, it's, again these like cru the crusader literature which was so prevalent during the period this just sense of the heroism of what they believed they were doing so I completely that's absolutely the right word they really <laughs> thought they were being heroic. No, it's interesting tying it into the history faculty there and a you know, different discipline and um, it was really informing um you know the the way in which people approached the orient there's a question here for elizabeth is asking you if you've looked to the importance of the images of palmyra for the emergence of british archaeology in the middle east another discipline um coming in well that's yeah that's interesting i suppose the the kind of work if you can even call it work the looting that's being done by the kind of guys that i'm looking at you know just just kind of anti-archaeology but it's actually quite interesting to sort of plot the way that let's say palmyra has been treated even by you know roman civilization it's always been a kind of contested site and a site over which a site that thought could be raised could be sacked and it's interesting that that kind of um violence uh, the violence that's perpetrated against Palmyra in the 18th century and um, which obviously I, as I argue has this imperial kind of imperial dimension then is played out in 19th century concepts conceptions of archaeology over which as we know kind of nationalist sentiments are explored and, and, and acted out you know the kind of French versus and, and, and as I sort of suggested very early on the ruins of Palmyra um, is kind of cast as an as a British explicitly sort of anti-French uh, effort and furthermore I uh, didn't have time to talk about it but um, there are extensive diaries from the expedition in um, held in London and I argue actually that they're James Dawkins as well as Robert Wood's diaries and it's full of they're full of the most kind of denigratory racist language and actually quite often those terms um, even when we're talking about a guy who's from Jamaica his kind of uh, go-to insults are about about, you know the repulsive French the stinking Scots you know so it's it's kind of about placing they're using archaeological inquiry even well kind of uh, expeditions I should say in the Middle East not really archaeological as a as a ground for um, exercising and kind of acting on um, uh, biases you know it, much closer to home and I think the fact that archaeology um, in Britain and France does grow along those lines in kind of 19th century um, 19th you know in the 19th century sphere I think is quite telling. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting because you, you brought in the question of the British and French um, competition which uh, Tim was asking about um, in the chat and he was he was asking if oriental studies we should also take into account Napoleon's role in Egypt and was asking what about orientalism as a feature of the comparative anxiety of the Brits compared to the French elites um, about the Orient. I mean, I think this was a question specifically for Mishka, so maybe if, if you'd like to talk a bit about the uh, French connection as well. Um, so, you know, I, my sort of, what I was talking about is really um, about academic Orientalism as opposed to um, the kind of Orientalism that is, where essentially I'm talking about Orientalism as a, as a discipline, so I just want to make that clear um, that this is not uh, this is not the same kind of Orientalism that 
um, you come you get from uh, some of these other figures like like Gertrude Bell. I mean, she's not an Orientalist in the academic sense of the word. Um, and, and similarly, you have sort of French writers writing about the Orient who are seen as Orientalists, but were not academic. So, you know, I just want to make it clear that that's what I'm talking about. Um, and in terms of French Orientalism, it's um, as a discipline, it's slightly different um, because from from the British, from British Orientalism, because um, it first of all, it's state, uh, the state patronage, which in Britain actually never happens. Um, this is a very interesting thing about Britain as opposed to, say, France and Germany, where Oriental studies is funded by the state or states. So in, 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 in Germany, you have these different uh, states and each one has universities and they vie with each other. So, you know, um, the um, Brandenburg and, um, you know, and, and you have so you have all these different Heidelberg Berlin, these universities have their, their bon, they're kind of competing with each other, but they are state funded. And in France, um, the, um, the, the Collège de France has a Sanskrit uh, professorship uh, that it founds. And then there's the, the, the Institute for uh, Modern Oriental Languages, um, and, but they're all funded by the state. Um, in Britain, it's very ad hoc. Um, and that's a, that's, a, um, that's a big distinction, but also in France, by the time you get to the 19th century, the interest has moved. So, if, you know, it's also about which part of the Orient. The Orient is is vast, grand bodies. And Napoleon in the Orient is obviously a particular part of the Orient. That's Egypt, and that creates a particular kind of Egyptomania in the 19th century. Um, then there's a, and then there's the Orient of the Middle East, uh, and you see that coming out in various ways. You can see it in, say, for example, Aida, which is this you know that the great opera, and then the 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 image. If you see the posters of Aida, and it's using very similar, um, actually, I think they lifted from the, 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 the encyclopedia that is, um, which whose name has just gone out of my head after Napoleon's, when in Napoleon's expeditions, he's, he, he take, there are these um, uh, draftsmen and scholars who go with him and they produce this, this huge kind of grand book and they have these sketches of the stones and then those are then enter posters as well as architecture, you know, um, uh, sets uh, of operas uh, or opera. Um, and that is, um, and that's one part of the Orient. And then there's also this sort of interest in, in, in India and Sanskrit, and that's a different part of the Orient. So there's, there's distinct Orientalisms, I suppose what yeah. I was about to say. Yeah, does that Someone help? was also asking, it, someone was asking the questions as well about um, whether it includes the Far East um, in Oxford's vision of Orientalism or you know, question different Orient or different Orientalisms. Yeah. Um so essentially again, so in, in France there's a huge interest in China and Japan in the 19th century. And um India has seen, you know, because some of this is aesthetic. Um it's also about kind of the objects that they're using. It's Chinoserie, you know, it's uh, you know it's 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 um pe people, you know, artists in Paris being influenced by Japanese wood cults. You know, so there's a there's a it's a it's a visual um, kind of experience as well as a, and a visual affinity. Um, and the interest is shifting there. And so there is an interest in the Far East, particularly in, in France. And you'll see and that is also reflected in a, a growing interest in Buddhism in France. And you have this um, kind of doyen of, uh, of Buddhist studies there, um, you know, etc. Et um, in terms of in, in Oxford, you know, because of that, because of that focus on colonialism and because that colonial interest in India and empire, particularly in the 19th century and Victoria becoming the Empress of India, um, there's a kind of focus on India to the exclusion of other places as a serious, as a place of serious study, scholarship. And in fact, Chinese as a language, as a discipline, does not enter Oxford until I think it's the 1880s. And the only reason is the professorship of Chinese at Oxford is because two Chinese merchants found it. And the professor of Chinese, the first professor, James Legg, uh, who incidentally I'm going to hear a paper about today by a colleague of mine just after this, there's another conference. Um, he um, is paid 200 pounds a year, as opposed to the Burden Professor of Sanskrit. That professorship was founded in 1832 with a salary of 1,000 pounds. So you see immediately the hierarchy um, of cultures in terms of intellectual importance given to it in Oxford. Obviously, this importance is not about um, you know, the intrinsic value of that culture, but the value of that culture to Britain for, for particular reasons, and those reasons change. Thank you. That's really interesting. The 
what's imported at Oxford compared to other places and in a sort of different idea of Orientalism. There's a comment here from Anand, which I think might might be a stimulating one. He's saying he's thinking of modern influencer culture here, elite travel and experiences for social prestige. So I don't know if you'd all like to maybe comment on how this might relate to what you've been talking about. Uh, do you see the connections to the present day? Uh, Elizabeth, you put your hand up. Yeah, I, I was re I've been really struck by this. One of the kind of uh, interests of mine are these society of dilettanti, you know, these kind of foppish, as I suggested, these sort of aristocratic and gentry men who um, kind of uh, pride themselves on their uh, connoisseurship and on their travel and also on their sexual exploits. I mean, one of these club, one of these clubs is called the Divan Club. Yeah, I mean, not a very coded reference to a bed. It's quite clear that, you know, kind of sexual adventure um, is, is a big part of how they kind of... Uh, um, identify themselves but but what struck me actually is this idea that the um the traditional grand tour is just getting a bit passe you know everybody's been there it's like the selfie at Santorini you know that's sort of lost its that's lost its glamour and so it's always looking for the next undiscovered part of the world or the next kind of adventure that one's meant to have you know and it's just that really comes across in their correspondence and I mean it's a hugely privileged position to be in but it really strikes me that actually the kind of although the world's globalization is not then was not then as it is now I think the kind of idea of the well-trammeled path versus something that's a little bit more uh, has a bit more of a frisk on of danger um, and that you can come home and kind of brag about is is, is 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 let's face it kind of alive and well and that yeah that really struck me. Siobhan do you see any connections with Gertrude Bell to the <laughs> I can't imagine Gertrude having an Instagram, to be honest. I think she would just think she was above Instagram. She wouldn't be on there. She'd rather have other people taking pictures of her and posting them. Um, but I don't know. There's obviously, yeah, there's obviously a lot of uh, prestige at the time attached to what she was doing. And she did publish books about her travels. And on um, one of her first books, she says, oh, I didn't know I wanted to publish it. But, you know, I was forced into doing it. But she still did it and then kept doing it. So, yeah. But going back to what I was saying earlier on about just having this like positioning herself as a very masculine person, you know, she wanted to write papers and be at the Royal Geographical Society giving papers. And so I think for her as an influencer, she wanted to be seen, I think probably more as an more as an academic than someone we might see in Dubai when we're trying to avoid the lockdown. What was she doing for the British government? What was her role for the British government? What was Gertrude's role for the British government? Yeah. That's, so that's another way of influencing or influencing policy, I guess. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's the difference. Is it's like she? I think that's the difference for her. Is she would rather have been influencing policy. Mm. Um, her role for the British government. I think it really goes back to her initial travels. And often the Turkish were saying they didn't want her to be in certain areas because they thought she was a spy. So this mm. is long before she gets involved with um, the government officially. But yeah, I, I've asked myself when I've been reading it whether or not they, they were actually right about what she was doing. Doing. And there's one incident where she she starts putting in about that she's going somewhere else and in the middle of the night, you know, they escape and they go to the place that she really wanted to, where she didn't have authority or a pass to be in. So, yeah, there's uh, there's definitely a part of me that wonders if they weren't right, that she was a spy from very early on. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Mishka, did you want to come in on that influencer? Oh, uh, no, sorry, I don't have anything to say about that. I actually have questions for uh, Siobhan and... Uh, and Elizabeth, and I was wondering if I could ask those questions or whether I should wait. Go ahead. We're, we're getting short on time now, so yeah, you better put your questions in. <laughs> yeah, I just want to get my questions in before we... Um, so thank you very much for both your papers. They were just um, so brilliant, um, and I learned so much from them. Um, and, and yeah, enjoyed them very much, and lovely pictures. <laughs> Um, it's always nice to see pictures. Um, what I wanted to ask was, was so with, with Siobhan, I really wanted to ask about um, the, the descriptions that you, you have of um, when Gertrude talks about natives, um, they're all men. And I wondered whether you had descriptions of women and how she saw women. And the reason I asked this is because, of course, you know, one of the turns in uh, Oriental studies has been about looking at women's voices and that could be both voice, I mean, fortunately now it includes women's voices who are not European, but it's also, it's been primarily about European women's voices. And, and um, one of the things I'm interested in, in the women orientalists I'm looking at is that um, they, they often have very patronizing ideas uh, and very imperialist ideas about, uh, about the cultures that they're studying. 
but um, they often choose women scholars to translate or women writers to translate from those languages. And that's for, and then they bring those writings into the corpus of, of literature that's available to study. And I, you know, I thought that was really interesting. So I just wondered whether you had anything to say about uh, Gertrude Bell and women or other women of that kind and women. And for Elizabeth, um, my question was really, you know, um, well, first of all, uh, thank you to for talking about James Dawkins. I didn't actually realize um, the connections, you know, and that he was at St. John's, so we should talk about that. Um, but I also wondered, did you, um, have you met James Dawkins, the scholar? Yeah, I'll let, shall I let Siobhan crack on? No, on. answer the question, I can go afterwards. <laughs> yeah, um, I have, and he was so helpful and really great, as I, I actually wrote, um, I, I did the same Masters, the Literature and Arts, actually, that Siobhan's doing, and um, while I was doing that, I decided to write this Masters dissertation about about James Dawkins and his brother as kind of connoisseurs and dilettanti. And then um, Jason Kelly, who's a dilettanti expert, put me in touch with James and we kind of we sort of squared that circle. And he's been, yeah, really very helpful mm -hmm. and a fascinating story. And actually much of the kind of land ownership study stuff that he's done is really at the bedrock now of quite a lot of the other um, men, West Indian slaveholders that I'm looking at because he's done such great foundational work on the kind of, um, changing nature of estates, the way that they that they use estates, the way that they buy land, enclose land, all those sorts of things. So yeah, his study's really seminal and yeah, really super. Are you talking about his own background? Because so I mean one of the when because when I met him, so he's because he's working a similar thing to what we're doing uh, at St. John's. And one of the things he talked about to me was how he was looking at the recent sale by um Richard Dawkins's family. So the Richard Dawkins the uh, the, the the evolutionary evolutionary biologist, who's who comes who's descended from that family and whose family then recently sold this painting um, that they owned from the 18th century and gave the proceeds to I think to Balliol, um, and he was talking about how he wanted to investigate that and he's particularly interested in it is because his family is descended from the slaves that were owned by the Dawkins family, um, and that's why they have that name. Um, and yeah, and so he's, you know, so he's actually investing, I mean, it's such a, he's investigating, in a sense, his own history, um, as well as this, this kind of larger history. So I just wanted to know if you, you know, if you had any comments on that. And the other thing was just that, as far as I can tell, I can't find Henry at St. John's, just James. Interesting. Okay. And I had, I had wondered, I, I, I got that from a contemporary source, but I've been, I have been wondering about it and I haven't followed up. So that's sort of, I, I went with it because I thought, well, you know, there's a, an, um, a kind of a alma mater of the older brother thing, but I, yeah, I could, I could look into that a little bit more detail. And actually, um, yeah, I mean, it's completely fascinating. This, the sort of, the study that James, the, the, the current James Dawkins um, has undertaken, which kind of has a whole public and social history dimension as well in terms of kind of giving voice back um, to people whose histories have effectively been completely erased. Um, and I'm conscious that, you know, I've just given a presentation which is about these dead, rich, white men who, you know, actually held um, people like James's ancestors and, and completely erased their voices. But I think that's what's one of the reasons that kind of taking a multi-pronged approach with these kind of histories is really important because actually once we once we aggregate all of this we're going to see just how very um multi-layered the, the different kinds of connections were but yeah I mean I really hope I don't know whether he's writing up his thesis as a book I certainly hope so because I think it'd be absolutely fascinating as, as I say for that kind of crossover particularly about what does public history mean in Britain what does it mean to be um you know kind of black history and all sorts of other um, aspects of well. how that history continues to be, how Oxford University continues to be imbricated and implicated in that history yeah. until the present day. Absolutely. Well, I, think, I think we're just, just we're out of time. Siobhan, do you want to answer your question quickly? Just a quick response. <laughs> uh, yeah, just quickly. Um, other women, she doesn't really like other women, is the short version. Um, she very much positions herself away from them. She talks very disparagingly of other women that she meets. Um, she definitely sees them as beneath her. Uh, she translates a lot of her own uh, work. So she learned Latin and Greek at a, a, a later stage. I think after she was at Oxford, 
good. Uh, te- she learns Arabic um, and she she translates the poetry of her feet. So I think she's doing a lot of the translation work herself and use it again in a masculine way and sort of like sim- uh, integrating it into her own work and her own papers. So rather than hiring someone to do it for her. But um, yes, I think, is that the quick answer? <laughs> Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, there's obviously loads more that we could continue talking about, but unfortunately we've been defeated by uh, the clock. So we'll have to stop there. But thank you very much, everyone, for brilliant papers and really rich uh, discussion. Uh, so next week then, was it's this next Wednesday at the same time, and it's on Voyages and Voyagers. And that panel is going to be starring Nandini Das and Emily Stevenson, Kauri Nagai and Claire Chambers. And it's going to be chaired by Anki Mukherjee. So please do join us for that next Wednesday. Thank you.